Today's episode is brought to you by the Tax Defense Group. Tax season is here, and that means that it's time to file. Instead of going through the hassle of using H&R Block, you can call the experts at the Tax Defense Group. They can handle your tax filing anywhere. Also, for a limited time, if you're a W-2 employee, you can save half off your filing. All you have to do is call the Tax Defense Group before April 15, 2020, and mention that you saw this ad on UCAST Studios. Call the Tax Defense Group today at 800-850-7973. That number again is 800-850-7973, and you can visit them online at the Tax Defense group.com. And the other sponsor for today is Writer Junkie. Writer Junkie offers a resume writing service for the low cost for $145. And with only a three-day turnaround, you can't beat that price and delivery time. Call Writer Junkie today at 805-587-7966. That number again is 805-587-7966. And you can visit them online at writerjunkie.com. Mention that you saw this at a new cast studios and they'll get right to work. If you like our content, please check out the other shows on the UCAST Studios Network. Like this video and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. You can also listen to our content on Apple, Spotify, and other podcast platforms. Hi, welcome to the Talk Spot. This is Marcus, and today I'm joined by Andrew Bernstein. Andy, thank you for coming on. How have you been doing? Just uh, checking off the days on the calendar here like everybody else, but, you know, doing okay. How did you find out that the NBA season was coming to a complete halt? I mean, yeah, good question. Well, we had that game on uh, the Lakers Brooklyn game, I think the 11th, March 11th, and that was when the NBA had put in some, uh, you know, some suggestions, let's say, of some social distancing with the media. They closed the uh, the training room and the locker room to only essential people. So something was definitely brewing at that point. Then the next night, there was an L.A. Kings game. Um, the Kings played Ottawa that night. And I was home watching, I don't think I was watching Sports Center. I was watching something, and they showed live what was going on in Oklahoma City mm. with uh, the game about to, just about to start, and then the big conference they had. And then we also knew that there was a game that was going to be going on in uh, Sacramento, right? That was about to start maybe an hour later. Once they called off the game in OKC, something told me that knowing the NBA as well as I do and being at the forefront of basically anything that happens in the sports world, that something major was coming down, just a matter of time. So I think it was the next morning that it, that it actually, you know, I think everything got shut down the next morning or about midday or so. Because I remember... Seeing that there was a post, I think it was by Woj, where, or the tweets, where he said that the NBA is contemplating playing games with no fans in the stadiums. Yeah. And yeah. then that game happened, like we mentioned, the, the Oklahoma City game against the Jazz, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, everything snowballed so fast, and all of a sudden there's no NBA. And then I think within yeah. a couple of days, the MLB announced that they weren't going to do their season. Hockey yeah. canceled and. Or, I mean, uh, the NCAA, March Madness, everything, yeah. No, you're right. I mean, once the news came out that Rudy Gobert had tested positive, I think that was that sealed the fate. You know, that was just it. The, the NBA and the rest of the leagues were not going to take a risk. Um, and they did the right thing. You know, it was a difficult decision, obviously, but they absolutely did the right thing. Yeah, and especially, I mean, at that time and even now, I mean, you can make the argument that, I mean, we still – know so little about this whole pandemic. I think I was like a lot of Americans before the NBA shut down where, yeah, I, I heard a little bit about it. I knew what was going on in China to an extent, but mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't really take it that, that seriously, to be completely honest yeah. with you. I, I didn't really yeah. think about it, you know, as, oh, wow, this is going to change my life. Fast forward three weeks now, and this is the biggest thing that's happened from a governmental standpoint to impact my life. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I lived through 9-11. You know, that was pretty profound. And, you know, the 60s, uh, various, the Kent State, for example, comes to mind. I remember I was 10 years old when that happened. I was five years old when um, JFK was killed. So I remember, you know, King, Bobby Kennedy. But in terms of the entire country being shut down, I mean, that, that's unprecedented. You know, but getting back to your point, I wish we had known about this earlier, and we, the public, because I think the government did know about it. I don't think they took it seriously enough. Obviously, they didn't, and I'm not trying to get political here, but if we had gotten in front of it at the end of January or early February, you know, maybe we wouldn't be sitting where we are right now with this, uh, this pandemic at the level it is and seeing 
what we're seeing on the news. Um, who knows? Who knows? But the news is was encouraging and still is encouraging from China and South Korea and places where they, they instituted the same social distancing and to halt the spread and or at least slow it down. So let's only hope that that has the same effect here. I mean, I, I'm really glad that the people, especially the players that have gotten, you know, it seems like they've basically recovered, at least from the news stories that I've yeah. read. Like I've read, yeah. you know, even though Marcus Smart's a Celtic, I still don't wish him any <laughs> physical ill will. It seems like he's recovered. It sounds like Rudy Gay or Rudy Gobert. Gosh, I don't know why yeah. I call him Rudy Gay. Um, yeah. One thing I wanted to kind of ask you a little bit about is, at least as of now, from what I've read online, that they're still going to do WrestleMania. I think it's supposed to be this weekend. They're going to do Come it on. with... Uh, really? Yeah. They were going to do it with no uh, no fans in attendance. What do you think about that? I think it's the stupidest thing that I've heard today. Um, <laughs> makes no sense to me. I mean, first of all, you're talking about a sport. If you're telling me it was golf, yachting, or something where there's like, you know, inherent uh, distance between the participants, I, I think I would, you know, raise an eyebrow, but I would probably see that that makes sense. But I think wrestling, you're a little close to the other um, participant. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, it makes no sense. I mean, I know that pe- people are starving with sports content, that networks are losing tens of millions of dollars a day or a minute. If we're all going to be staying home and uh, safer at home and quarantined and all that stuff, I think that has to extend to every aspect of society. Keep first responders and food service and all that and the food supply. But you know what I'm talking about. WrestleMania is not is not an essential service. I think uh, I think you you make a very good point. It's hard to say yeah. that in this world right now that wrestling or really any sport, really any kind of form of entertainment is necessarily essential right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, I hope I don't offend any of you or any of your listeners, but I would say that WrestleMania is never essential, <laughs> even in the best of times. I mean, I. Look, I'm a you know just lay my cards. I can't stand that's that. I don't even call it a sport. It's a spectacle. It's theater. It disguises the sport. I don't like it. Doesn't you know? It's like country music. I personally don't like country music. You know, kudos to friends and people I know who love country music, but it's not something that I would listen to or seek out. And I've never been able to really put my finger on it. What is the big draw? I just don't get it. You know, I mean, it just makes no sense to me. I don't know. Well, personally, I mean, I think, you know, a person that's a fan of just watching competitive sports, I, I feel like the fact that they're competitive and you don't know what's going to necessarily happen that's not foreordained, I mean, that that's what attracts me about it is, you, I mean, yeah. you don't really know what's going to happen and no one, right. no one has a script that says, okay, the end yeah. of the fourth quarter, the Lakers are going to purposely miss five shots and allow the Rockets yeah. to come back in. Whereas, you know, WWE, yeah. the scripts even leak all the time. <laughs> Look, there's, there's millions of people who love it, and, and God bless them, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, if if they are getting pleasure in watching it, and it's fun, and it's a family kind of activity, then that's great. You know, I mean, it's not my cup of tea. That's all I can say. There's been at least talk online, at least publicly, they're portraying this idea of having the central locations, where, or maybe a big central location, where yeah. I guess a handful of games, six or seven games would be played, I guess mm-hmm. to have some kind of fulfillment of the season having 70 games, and yeah. then it would jump right into the playoffs, but in this you know, one central location and no people in the stands. Mm-hmm. From what you've heard, I mean, what, what do you think about that idea? Is that something that you think is more likely than not that could happen? Well, that's interesting. You know, I, mean, I hadn't actually heard about it. I'm kind of st- trying to say is tuned in, but... I was actually doing my podcast yesterday, and I guess uh, Mark Stein brought it up. Look, anything to get the NBA back on the court in a reasonable, safe environment um, uh, at at a prudent time is fine with me. Uh, You know, to play and not to have no fans and to play in front of an empty arena um, is weird. (laughs) Mm. Uh, But all this is weird too what's going on so if they're really intent on getting a some semblance of a season or a complete season in as much as they can uh maybe that's the way to go and maybe that's a way to ease the players back into competitive playing again and 
Um, so they don't have to go through a prolonged sort of mini, you know, training camp or whatever. And being in a central location, it'd be easy to broadcast. It would be a, um, a controlled environment for the players and keeping, you know, health-wise, keeping them all in one place and the crew and people like me. So, you know, I think it's an interesting idea. I mean, I can't think that far ahead right now. I think where we all are is like, what are the numbers today? And is it is the curve going up? Is the curve flattening down? Is it coming down? You know, what's going to happen? I mean, I don't think we could think past two or three days from now right now, right? Which is so foreign to me and people like me who are in professional sports, who our whole life is planned around the NBA schedule. You know, so because I mean, um, for some, I mean, yeah. like you typically, I mean, this is the time of year where this playoff game is going to start here, and you know, we have a pretty good idea. It's going to be okay, these games are going to be, you know, Lakers versus if it was still Grizzlies, you know, the eighth seed, like hey, you're going to be here and here. I mean, don't they like at this time, they're everybody's planning for that kind of stuff, right? Like the playoffs, um, basically, right? Not specifically games and dates per se, oh, but okay. And opponents, because it's a little still up in the air. I mean, the uh, the bottom of let's say the Western Conference playoff seating was still still kind of up in the air. I mean, and also you know we don't know. Pretty sure the Lakers would probably get the one seed, but you know, is Denver going to overtake the Clippers, or is uh, New Orleans going to make a surge and get the eight seed, or maybe seven? And what's going to happen? So, I pretty much know. Well. Um, <laughs> If we hadn't been going through all this, I, I know that I would be starting at home, first of all. Mm-hmm. I know it would be that you know first weekend of the playoffs, uh, the undoubtedly a Sunday game. Um, and I could sort of project a schedule, sort of, you know, knowing from experience, at least for the first round. Um, the good news, you know, in, in the perfect world, if we weren't, is that both my L.A. teams would be home in the first round at the same time conceivably have a Saturday Clipper game, Sunday Laker game, you know, Tuesday Lakers, Wednesday Clipper, you know, something like that, which is cool, you know, and it's, it's fun. I, I, the only the only bummer is is that my b- beloved L.A. Kings were not making the playoffs, so wouldn't have the, uh, the thrill of having all three playoff teams in at the same time. Mm. How far away were the Kings from getting into the playoffs? Like, I... I- um, they were pretty far, my friend. Oh, okay. Oh, so they were a really <laughs> bad team then. Yeah, unfortunately, it was not a good year in, oh, uh, man. in L.A. Kingland. But, um, you know, I still love them and uh, still love going to games and covering games. I've been doing hockey longer than I've been shooting basketball, believe it or not. So, you know, it was my first love as a kid going to Ranger games. Growing. I'm actually wearing a Ranger shirt right now. I don't tell any of my L.A. Kings <laughs> Oh, so when they played in the Stanley Cup, did you did you wear the sh- did you wear that jersey or did you? Oh, dude, that's the craziest story if you want to hear it. But so I grew up this diehard Rangers fan. My dad had season tickets my entire upbringing. My first game, I probably was six or seven years old. The old Madison Square Garden on Eighth Avenue before they they moved it to the current Madison Square Garden, nineteen seventy one. I don't know. I must have gone to uh, at least in high school. I remember going basically to every home game. So we, you know, we'd make a little trek from Brooklyn to Manhattan and meet my uncle and go to our seats. We always had the same seats in section 321 in the green section, you know, which was like the next to the top deck behind the goal. Mm. And anyway, fast forward, we're in the 90, I'm sorry, we're in the 2014 Stanley Cup Finals. I'm working for the LA Kings and who are we playing in the Cup Final? My beloved home team, the Rangers. So I got to go back to MSG where I grew up <laughs> and I'm wearing it, you know, Kings, I'm wearing my Kings stuff. I mean, I'm the Kings team photographer, I'm wearing a Kings jacket. I got, you know, my credentials says LA Kings and I was not greeted very warbly at the Garden, quite frankly. The, uh, you know, the New York fans, the, uh, the fan sitting next to where my photo position was, which is right along on the glass behind the goal, which was not a usual photo position. The NHL had to carve out these, you know, sort of makeshift photo positions for all the photographers who were covering. Anyway, they didn't particularly like me being there, you know. And <laughs> so I started to talk to the guy and he was getting pretty animated with me. And, and he used, you know, some choice words. And 
All I did was I said, sir, I said, can I just ask you to look up there? He goes, what do you talk about? I said, just look up there in, the, in that, and they're not green anymore. The garden is all the same color seats now. But I said, you see that section? It's still section 321. He goes, yeah, what about it? I said, I grew up there. I grew up 321, row two, seats one through four. <laughs> and he looked at me, and then all of a sudden, like, everything changed. <laughs> and I said, Forgive the attire, you know. I'm just here doing my job, but I got to tell you, my heart's still here at the Garden. I mean, of course, I was thrilled that the Kings, you know, won that series. That goes without saying, but it was just kind of an interesting dynamic. It also reminds me the what was it, the '84, I believe, '84 or '85 NLCS when I was working for the Dodgers and had to go back to Shea Stadium for the uh, for the pennant. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the same situation because the Mets were my, you know, baseball team growing up. So it was the same thing. I actually had a guy throw a hot dog with mustard <laughs> at me at the back of my, and I still have, I still have the Dodger jacket that I wore. And it's got this giant mustard stain right across the Dodger logo. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yep. I can't believe a guy would waste a whole hot dog. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's unbelievable. I think they weren't happy with it. We, uh, we were actually beating them in that particular game. But it was freezing. It was October. It was probably at like 38 degrees at Chase Stadium, freezing to death. You know, not used to that, um, those conditions. So glad that, that was over. I got back to Southern California. When was the last time they won uh, a Stanley Cup? Oh, God, I don't even know, man. I mean, so I it's been remember. a long time? Yeah, I mean, I, they... You know, they won during the uh, the Messier years, right? That was that was ninety four, I believe, right? That they won. And weren't they the the Knicks and the Rangers were in the final at the same time? And I remember that because I was back there covering the Knicks. I believe for the Knicks Houston final. I think that was the year of the of the OJ, you know, Bronco chase, and and we were all at the Garden waiting to start the game, and they delayed the start of the game because of the Bronco chase, which was, you know, probably the first time in history that in any NBA final game or World Series or anything was ever delayed because of the car chase. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking it up right now. So the last Stanley Cup they won was in 94, and the one before that was 1940. Yeah, 94 was the last one, so that's a long time ago. It's, what, 26 years ago. Yeah. That's something that really blows me away about New York teams is it seems like New York fan, like sports fans are really into the teams and all these teams have such history behind them all. Yeah. It, it's just, it doesn't seem like any of them can win anything outside of the yeah. Yankees. Yeah, I know. Well, they did have that magical year in 69, 70 when the Mets won, right? 69, Knicks won, and Jets, that's famous uh, – Super Bowl with Joe Namath, they won. So that was pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like Boston a few years ago when Patriots and uh, and the Red Sox and who else won that year? Well, the Celtics. I guess it was the Celtics. No, it was the it was. Bruins. They were in the... Oh, yeah, the Bruins. Right. But they, yes, exactly. they lost in game seven, thank God, because I, I was thinking to myself, like, oh my gosh, yeah. if the Bruins win, I think it was, was going to be something weird where they were going to be the first team since, I guess, since 69-70 that would have had yeah. three championships in one yeah, like, sport yeah. year. Yeah, that uh, yeah, we hated Boston. Yeah. There were two cities we hated uh, being Ranger fans. We hated Boston and we hated Philly. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's the Broad Street bullies, you know, in that whole era of those guys. So you know, it's funny how sports. It, there's so much passion in sports. I sometimes argue that people are more passionate about their sports than they are about like their own family. So oh, I, I so, think absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It seems like most people, when you ask them about their family, all they have to say is they're good or they tell you yeah, one story. Right. Or they're talking about, you know, something that they did, some sporting event they all went to or whatever. One of the real catalysts for launching Legends of Sport, you know, my platform, is really the the family connection, the heritage, the tradition of sports carried from one generation. You've been to a Dodger game, for example, and you'll see, you know, the little kids wearing like a Kershaw jersey and... The dad is wearing like a Garvey jersey, and then the grandpa's wearing maybe like a Newcomb or or a Jackie Robinson or something. You know, it's just so much history in sports, and it you know that's what makes it so difficult right now because we don't have that outlet, we don't have that that uh, familiar tie of of sports getting us through something you know a difficult period, and that's you know I think it's manifesting itself 
people feeling very disconnected from everything that is familiar to them. A lot of guys that I know, they like sports is the number one thing they talk about. They can talk about four sports and that's it. And I mean, for right now, I mean, there's so little, I mean, I know the NFL, I know they had their, um, they had some trades or, or not trades, Mm -hmm. uh, free agency signings, but that was like a little appetizer. I think sports yeah. fans were like, I mean, yeah. you know, I guess, thank God, yeah, Tom Brady did move to the Buccaneers because at least that was some content. Yeah, because it was it, some kind of story, exactly, yeah. But if, well, I think the NFL is going to be the only league that's going to come out basically unscathed from this thing, right? Um, and, if, and they're the if, you league, know, and, if we're all back to somewhat normal life by June or so, or July... Um, you know, the NFL doesn't normally start up until then with their training camps and preseason. So, you know, be good for them that they're, they're able to kind of carry on business as usual. And they were the one sport that that could have survived the longest anyways without it. I mean, all these other sports, I mean, I, I know there's been a lot of reports about basketball this season that the ratings have been down. Yeah. I know the NFL they are i mean even though my i mean the number one sport i love is basketball i mean i love basketball more than any other sport i mean yeah. I'll, I'll watch nfl games I'll, I'll follow the season but i mean i just know the nfl just makes so much more money than the other leagues because yeah. people just tune in like crazy and i do think that's a little ironic that the, t- <laughs> the sports league that probably could have survived the longest theoretically is the one that's most likely like what you're saying they'll just start right back up without any interference yeah yeah which is good. If you're an NFL fan, you know, your life is totally chaotic and upside down right now. But yet you have the normal routine of knowing, hey, you know, things are going to start up in July. We're going to have our training camp. We're going to go into our preseason. The season's going to start on time, end on time, you know, all that. But the other leagues, like you said, are kind of fighting for some kind of semblance of salvaging a season in one way or the other. I mean, look at baseball. I mean, we were, what, a week away from, 10 days away from baseball actually starting with, with, you know, opening day and everything. So, you know, so sad. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I guess for the NBA, I mean, if you decide to give your own opinion, I mean, what do you think the odds are that this season will actually come to an end and there will be a a 2019-2020 champion? Well, I mean, I read yesterday that I think of the seven, that it's always been an NBA champion of the 73 years the league has been in existence, and I don't think anybody wants that streak to end. You know, we've had we've had lockouts and all kinds of things, but they've always crowned a champion. I know that Adam Silver wants it done in a way that's well, first and foremost, you know, prudent and respectful to the health crisis and making sure that everybody from top to bottom is healthy if we all go back to work. In, in a safe environment, but B, that it's that it's a respectful way of continuing the season, you know, honoring the game, honoring the schedule, uh, honoring a champion. There's always been a lot of talk about uh, Spurs, I believe, we call them the asterisk champion or whatever. Um, you know, I don't personally believe any of that. It just was what it was with, with that work stoppage. But I know Adam Silver... There's a lot of really smart people back there in New York, and I know Adam Silver's going to make the right decision. You know, when the time is right, we'll all be back on the court in one way or the other. You know, it could be in, in some concentrated area, like you said, in one location, at least at the beginning. Um, or maybe we're playing in our own arenas in front of no fans. Who knows? Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I think that everyone will be in the same boat. Nobody's going to be favored over anyone else in terms of – location or um what's available to them in terms of arena schedule what have you so you know he's looking at all those factors i know that uh i know that you know you do work with the clippers and you have more love for them than i do Mm -hmm. i was gonna say the amount of bad stuff that's happened to the clippers is Uh just truly astounding because i mean yeah this year like it's it's pretty clear it was lakers clippers and bucks one of the three of them are gonna most likely they're not gonna win the title yeah. And so this is most likely the best Clipper team mm-hmm. ever. Kawhi is looking like he's the best player to put on a Clippers jersey ever. I mean, you can make an argument if he was the greatest Clipper, not the same argument you make with the Raptors. Yeah. But the Clippers, I mean, my God, it's you, you have yeah. everything lined up for you this season. The Warriors yeah. aren't there, yeah. and yeah. this season yeah. just totally ends. I mean, 
Yeah. Well, it's interesting, Marcus. I, I had this exact conversation with the great Ralph Lawler, the Hall of Fame broadcaster, 40 years with the Clippers, who decided to retire before this season, right? And he's going to be guest on my podcast next week. And we, you know, we talked about that. Like, are they, you know, are they snake bit or something? Or are they, um, you know, behind some kind of, some kind of mystical cloud or whatever, but it is just is what it is. Um, And sometimes going through something like this and then reaching the mountaintop and becoming a champion, maybe not this year, maybe not next year, maybe, maybe this year or next year, who knows, whatever, however it turns out. But when they finally get that banner to hang on the wall, I I don't think anybody will ever question that they earned it. (laughs) You know, because they've been through so much, like you said, in, in their history. Well, that's that's what makes, again, I mean, this is one thing that I love about, you know, real sports is, you know, for right. the NBA, I mean, you have all these, and that's one thing I really like about the uh, the NBA is you have all these plot lines and, you know, yeah. it's, all these things are so interesting. So even the Lakers, it's like, you know, yeah. so obviously there's all this craziness, but then there's Kobe's passing and then there's the idea yeah. of we're going to win it for Kobe and we haven't won a title in 10 years, but we've been in the finals. I think the Lakers is something crazy. Like the Lakers have been in the, in the finals every like year of a new decade for like five <laughs> decades or something weird like that. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. this is like one of the longest title droughts the Lakers have had. I, I guess what the drought between Magic and and Kobe's that was the largest one because what was that 88 to 2000 so that was 12 years mm-hmm. so I mean yeah you have all these kind of plot threads and then yeah the Clippers this is you know their best team ever maybe this was the Bucks yeah. they were on track to have the third best record ever this is the best Bucks team since Kareem yeah. and you had all these interesting plot lines kind of clashing and it just it sucks that it all just kind of just ended and especially even too from a lakers standpoint i mean the lakers the last three games that they played they play the bucks beat the bucks two years later play the clippers beat the clippers and then they you know they lost yeah. that that they lost to the nets like when anthony davis missed that like the game winning shot but yeah, yeah that's so crazy but yeah yeah it's just it just sucks that everything i mean again obviously like what you mentioned earlier i mean there's so many other things that you know there's people now being unemployed there's people getting yeah. sick and i mean those things are so much of a bigger concern than sports but oh yeah but it's sure it's just unfortunate that i really thought i, I really thought man but this was this playoffs or these playoffs are going to be incredible the season was great i mean i was i was loving watching the lakers i mean i loved every time i see a laker yeah. game and then i see you on the court i'm like oh yeah. man, there's my friend andy i was yeah i know well look marcus we're all in the same boat man so you know it's not like last year for example which was so sad with LeBron going down on Christmas Day and then just not, not being able to make it back and the team not making the playoffs and all that stuff. I mean, that was, you know, that was just really disappointing because of the promise of him coming to L.A. and all that stuff um, and turning the franchise around. But, you know, all 30 teams are in this at the same time, going through the same issues. Um it's going to be interesting to see once play starts up again, um, how that all works. You know, you have you know a couple of teams out there with new coaches or newer coaches. We've got some trades that had just happened. You know, around the trade training deadline, uh, players who had been injured will be coming back. Like Kyrie Irving will be, you know, he'll be coming back after that injury, which would have sidelined him for what like six weeks or whatever. You know, what about a guy like Demarcus Cousins who? Yeah. You know, maybe even who knows with KD. I don't think we'll see him this year. But Steph Curry had already started. You know, he started his comeback and Clay Thompson and all that stuff. So if they're playing into like August. Are we going to see those guys? You know, suddenly make an appearance. <laughs> um, so that could be kind of a cool bonus, right? Yeah, I mean, if you're the team that has to play the Nets in the first round, and if like what you're saying, if there's a possibility that Kyrie is back, and if let's say. Yeah. If it's a small chance, let's say Durant is back. Yeah, that throws everything totally off for a loop. I mean, yeah, yeah, could be an interesting whole new storylines that develop from this whole thing, right? Yeah, it definitely could be. 
Well, Andy, yeah, definitely. I, w- I want to thank you so much for coming on. Real quick, how, who are some of the guests that you have coming on your podcast, and how can people listen to and how can people access it and everything? Oh, well, thanks. Thank you, Marcus. You're always so great about letting me promo my stuff. So we just started our third season of the podcast, and it's called Legends of Sport. You can find it really on, on any of your favorite um, podcast networks, but primarily it's launched on Anchor. And um, Anchor, you know, Spotify, also on uh, Apple Podcasts. So it's on, you know, a bunch of podcasts. So the podcast, again, is called Legends of Sport with Andrew D. Bernstein, which is, happens to be me. You can, let's see, if I can give you the URL, but uh, it's easy to find if you just look it up. But the, um, the URL is uh, anchor.fm slash Andrew hyphen Bernstein. So let's look it up there. Um, the upcoming guest we have is we just launched this week with Pau Gasol. Had a great conversation with him. Came out with a, a podcast today with, with really an incredible journalist, a great friend of mine, Brad Turner, who's been a longtime beat writer on the NBA beat for the uh, LA Times. And next week, we're going to have Ralph Lawler on Tuesday, um, Hall of Fame broadcaster for the Clippers. I uh, got Mark Stein in the bullpen um, either next week or the week after. Talk to a few other people. There's going to be some surprises, some people who are not necessarily household names in sports, but who can speak to what's going on in the sports sort of psychological landscape right now. (laughs) People who are helping athletes stay in shape or uh, deal with their, um, you know, being in best physical and mental shape and how they have the techniques that they're using with them. How how can they help the general public like us? So that's going to be exciting. And, um, Working on getting some some top name uh, female athletes, not just um, on the WNBA side, but female athletes across the board. So, you know, stay tuned. The best way to to really be in tune with what we're doing is on our social media. It's Instagram is at at Legends of Sport. Twitter is at Legends underscore of Sport. And we have a great blog. I don't know if you've ever used my blog, but the blog we have is called the Legends of Sport blog. <laughs> easy to remember and it's le- it's uh, legends of sport dot blog and it's interactive and we're posting stuff every day on the blog some of it related to that week's podcast some of it related to this day in sports history um so i got two really great people who are working on that veronica and michael every single day um, updating that and my social media um twitter and instagram at adb photo inc and you're gonna, you know, you're gonna see a lot of my vintage stuff on there, and just trying to keep people as entertained as possible during this uh, this drought of sports. I saw you do. Uh, it was on Spectrum, but you mm-hmm. did an interview with Phil Jackson again. I, I don't remember yeah. what year that was, and mm-hmm. I think it was a multi-parter. And from yeah. the part that yeah, I yeah. caught, yeah, it was incredible. I remember you, you guys you. were talking about a segment about. Um, it was a photo you took of Phil talking to uh, Michael Jordan. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was so fascinating. Yeah. I thought that was a great interview you did uh, with him. Well, thanks. Yeah, that that show, by the way, if if you're a Spectrum subscriber, it's called Through the Lens, and it's a show actually that I created and I I co-produce with Spectrum. Um, I think we've done maybe twelve shows or so. Um, it's basically I sit down with a Laker personality, anybody from Jeannie Buss or James Worthy or Gary Vitti, uh, Phil Jackson, like you said and talk about their career through my photos. And then, of course, the conversation just keeps going about uh, the era and, um, you know, who was playing who and the rivalries and all that kind of stuff. And one of my favorites was with Phil and also uh, with Pat Riley. He was the last one that I actually shot a while ago. So we're hoping to start that back up at some point. Um, I love doing that. It seems like the fans really like it, too. So, you know. Stay tuned, <laughs> and uh, you know we'll announce all that on the social media um, if that uh, happens to start up again. I don't know what it is like I, I just really like hearing Phil Jackson. It's just so interesting to hear him yeah. talk, at least in these interviews. I mean, and he just seems like yeah, such a fascinating person. So when I came across that, I was just literally flipping through the channels, and I saw I was like, oh wow, this is this is really cool. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'm sure you're aware of, of the ESPN series that's starting on April 19th, The Last Dance. Oh, yeah. Right? I've, I've, yeah, I've, I've heard about it. 
Yeah, so that you should, you guys, you and all your audience should check it out because uh, it's a multi-part series produced by some very, very good friends of mine at Mandalay Sports Media and also um, uh, NBA Entertainment is basically all of NBA Entertainment's footage. Some very close colleagues of mine I've worked with for 30 plus years um, shot basically all of this thing. And um, you'll see some great interviews there and vintage footage and great moments. A lot of behind the scenes stuff that uh, that I was privy to be part of. So um, I hope people get to see that. I'm, I'm hoping to get some personalities from that team on the podcast. So stay mm. tuned on that as well. If you get Dennis Rodman on, I'd love to, <laughs> especially I'd love to hear that one. That would be awesome. Yeah, I've been trying to be chased to Dennis for like two years. He sometimes he'll write back, sometimes he won't. You know, he's a little bit tough to to get. But yeah, he would be awesome. He'd be great, or Scotty Pippen, or Steve Kerr, or something like that. I feel like Scotty. I mean, he, he's on ESPN. Is he? Yeah. he works for ESPN yeah. now, right? He's not even oh, just yeah. a guest. Co- yeah, I mean, no, no, he's still. You know, he's a regular on the jump, and uh, you know, he's a good friend. I know Scotty, so okay. yeah, you know, let's see, let's see if. Um, you know, I can ring the right bell and, and get get some response and hopefully we'll get some of these guys to speak about it because that was such a special year as well. It almost mm-hmm. seems like he is by far, it looks like he's in the best shape of any previous player, like or I guess retired player that's like in his fifties. Like Scott yeah. it looks like he almost looks like he could still play. I don't know. Yeah. It looks like he's in great shape, like he's so slim yeah, he, still. Yeah, yeah. I saw him somewhat recently at uh I th- it was a Laker. I'm pretty sure it was a Laker game, and um, he was doing the jump or across the street. And I think he came over to the game. It's with his family and stuff. He's always so gracious, and I love Scotty. He's always was been wonderful to me. You know, in the Dream Team and all the Bulls years. And then he came. If you remember, he came to the Lakers for a little while. He was on Portland. You know, one of the truly great guys in our sport. He was, I believe, an assistant coach for a year oh, with okay. with Phil. Wasn't there a trade that was talked about between the Bulls and the Lakers for mm, Lakers to get yeah. Scotty? I don't remember that. I, I, it's possible. I don't remember. I think he came, and I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure he came when Phil came back for the second time. Um, oh, Scotty. So that was like well, 2009, I believe. Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, yeah, my, my timeline might be wrong, but I remember him, he and Kobe going at it together on the court, you know. And, I think that was great for Kobe to have Scotty there. <laughs> he always loved the competition. Yeah, I, I could totally see that. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, we have Kobe's Hall of Fame enshrinement to look forward to at the end of the summer. And uh, oh, That's right. Yeah, so you know, I'm trying to put together a, a series on the podcast leading up to that um, mm-hmm. with key people that are very influential or part of his life. So stay tuned on that as well. Very poignant time that he's going to be enshrined. And um, I think there'll be a lot of people who want to talk about it, talk about him. So I want to provide that that outlet to have that voice. No, that, that totally makes sense. And mm-hmm. I'll definitely keep an eye out for that, too. I mean, that I mean, since you knew Kobe, you knew him personally and just his his life. I mean, it was yeah, just so incredible, especially to I mean everywhere. But of course, you know, of course, you know, for the NBA in general, Lakers fans, LA people, and mm-hmm. I mean, just with Kobe, yeah, he just seemed like such a unique person. Where he, like, he had all these talents, and he just had this. Yeah, yeah, he was, he was everything, and 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 everything you're saying, and more so. Um, so sorely missed. It's still a shock. Uh, grief is always going to be there. That void. Um, will always be there for all of us. You know, if we knew him, we didn't know him. He was part of all of our lives. It, it, you know, you don't even have to be a sports fan. You know, he transcended sports. So, um, yes, very, very sad. Uh, and what a terrible start of the year this has been. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> what can we say? Yeah. You know, with, with with my my longtime boss and one of my friends and mentors david stern passing away in january and then of course the shocking death of kobe and gianna now this whole situation it's just we need to just get through this part of the year and make the second two-thirds of the year a lot better that's all i could say <laughs> <laughs> i can agree with you more andy well definitely well yeah thank you so much for coming on i appreciate it again and i look forward to talking to you again soon marcus take care anytime pal always good to talk to you man 
we want to thank today's sponsors again, the Tax Defense Group and Rider Junkie. You can contact the Tax Defense Group at 800-850-7973. And Rider Junkie's phone number again was 805-587-7966.